In this video, I'm going to teach you how to build your own blogging platform like Medium without writing a single line of code using Bubble. Awesome. Yes. Before I say another word though, let's dive in and take a look at what we're going to be building today. Over in a demo of my app here, we're going to start on the registration page I have created. And I'm just going to add in the details of a new account that I'd like to sign up. From here, I can choose to register my account. It's going to add a new entry in my database. Then once I have an account, I can choose to start writing my very first story here. I'm going to add in a title. I'll then also add in the actual body of the story itself. I can then choose to save my story here, which will prompt me to add a featured image as well as some relevant tags. Let's add the tags of startups as well as no code. I can then choose to either save this story as a draft or I could go ahead and publish this. Then over on my homepage here, I can scroll through a list of all of these stories published by people that I follow, as well as if I wanted search through a list of stories by a search query or even a relevant category. Let's say I wanna search for all of the posts about Bubble. I can add this query in. It's then gonna redirect me through to a search results page and display a list of all of the relevant articles for this topic. I can then even click through to view the full story. And on this page, it'll display the full contents of this post, as well as the ability to engage with this post by either giving it a clap, or I could even add a comment if I would like. Once I publish this, it's going to add that to the list of total comments here and it's going to create a notification for the publisher of this post. And now on this story page, we also have the ability to share this across any social platform. And now I also just wanted to show you that this product we're building today is going to be completely responsive. So regardless of what device a user is viewing this on, everything's going to fit nicely on their screen. And now even just through this demo, there was a couple of specific features that I didn't get the chance to point out like being able to bookmark posts, as well as view a dedicated user's profile, which of course will not only display a list of all of the posts that they have published, but also give us the chance to follow or unfollow this specific person. I've been using Bubble over the past three years and I'm yet to find another no-code tool that matches its capabilities. What I love about Bubble is that you can create your own custom database, design a fully responsive interface, stitch your app together and make it functional using workflows, and also the ability to integrate with third-party tools and services. And to be frank, each of these individual features would be a standalone no-code product. So you can kind of think of Bubble like the avatar for no-code tools, bringing all of the no-code tool nations together. If you're new to the channel and you're not familiar with my work, I'd previously worked directly with the Bubble team to write their How to Build blog series. This series took a list of the top products out there on the market, like Uber, Airbnb, and Instagram, and explained the step-by-step -step process to rebuilding each of those products with Bubble's no-code tool. Now, while this written series was helpful to thousands of no-coders across the world, what I wanted to do was take the time to create my own video version of this series, because if you're anything like me, I much prefer to follow along to a video tutorial. And as an instructor, it allows me to show you a world of additional insights and details, and I can break all of these down into easy to follow instructions. Of course, one thing I would just like to point out is that this video series has no affiliation with Bubble, and it's something that I'm doing within my own time. Now, as you saw in the demo I'd previously just shown you, today we're going to be building our own blogging platform like Medium. Look, there's so much that I want to cover within this tutorial, so I'm going to close my mouth, let's open up a bubble editor, and we can dive right into it. Within our tutorial today, one of the first things that we're going to build out isn't actually a core feature that users are going to interact with. Instead, I wanted to take the time to build out the necessary database that will power the entire application we're going to create today. And now what you'll see in my tutorial today is that I've created a doc here in Notion that sets out a list of everything I'll need to add in. So all of my data types and fields, as well as all of the features that I'll be covering in our tutorial today. 
And as you can see, this list is quite expansive. Now, the thing I love about Notion is that it allows you to tick items off as you add them into your application, which just helps you keep a better track of where you are throughout the entire building process. And of course, I'll be sure to share a link to this doc so you can make a duplicate version of it and you can follow along at your own pace. But what you'll see in my Notion doc here is that the very first items I have is just a list of, as I mentioned, all of the data types and data fields that are going to sit within them. And now if you've never built out your own database in Bubble, I know just how confusing this can all seem. And so I'm gonna be sure to explain everything you need to know in as much detail as possible. And I'm gonna highlight each of these steps I take along the way, just to make sure you actually understand and can comprehend all of the concepts that I'm explaining. But what we're gonna do is open up a, a brand new Bubble editor that I have created. And we're going to head to our data tab on the left hand side here. It's currently just sitting below my little screen recorder. So it's the data tab here. And now what you'll find is that within your data tab, you have the ability to add in two lists of items. On the left hand side, you'll be able to add in your overarching data types. And then on the right hand side, you'll be adding in your data fields within each data type. And now if you've never created a database within Bubble, the difference between a data type and a data field is relatively straightforward. A data type is an overarching entity that your users will be able to create within your application. And the data fields are all of the information that sit within each entry. And so if I'm creating a database from scratch, the way I like to approach structuring my data types is that I like to just write a list of all of the things that someone will need to create within our application. So for example, we have a user data type because someone will need to create a user account. We then also have a story data type because someone's gonna need to create a story in our Medium clone. We then have the story content and I'll be explaining in a moment why I've separated this from our existing story field but essentially it's just to help maintain the longevity of our application by just breaking down some of the larger data fields that we need to store under our story. We also have a comment data type. And so because people are gonna to need to be able to create comments, I have this as its own entity. And then finally, we also have notifications. So whenever someone creates an engagement event, like a clap or a comment, I wanna be able to create a record of that and display it to the person who is receiving it. And now because all of these things are going to be created by users, these are the overarching data types. And within that, as you'll see in my checklist here, I have stored all of the data fields which identify all of the information we'll need to save for each entry. So every single time someone creates a user account, I'd like to store things like their name, their bio, their profile photo, a list of all the topics they're interested in, and so on. And so what I also like to do before I actually build out my database inside a bubble is just map out a list of all of the data fields I think will need to belong in every single data type. And then what I can do is actually just jump into bubble and build these out so I can transfer them directly from my Notion doc. A couple of things I'd just like to point out first though, is that you may notice by default, you have an overarching user data type already created by default inside of your bubble editor. And the reason for this is because in order to allow people to actually register accounts, you of course need to have a user data type. So bubble provides you with this. So you actually don't need to create your own user data type. Now within this user data type, Bubble also provides you with a few data fields by default. So you can see here within our user data type, we have an email field. And so because whenever someone creates an account, they're gonna to need to register an email and a password, which they will use to later on log into that account, which they will use to later on log into that account. This comes standard with any Bubble user data type. And there is also a password data field. However, you just won't be able to see that in plain text just for privacy reasons. But essentially you won't need to create an email and a password data field. 
Another thing I'd just like to point out is that beside our user data type, you may notice that there's some text here that says that there's privacy rules applied to this. If I was to click on this, it's going to open up our privacy tab here. And what you'll be able to see is that by default, Bubble provides its own privacy settings, which can actually limit the functionality of what we're going to be creating today. And so with this privacy setting here, it only allows users to view only the content that they create themselves within our application. So let's say if someone was to post a story in our Medium clone, as it stands, they would be the only person who would be able to view that. And that's not the experience we want to create. Medium is almost like a community-based platform. So we want people to be able to see the work of every single person on that platform. And so this privacy rule isn't going to be applicable to us today. So what I'm going to do is head over to the trash can icon and I'm just going to choose to close that. If you don't take the time to do this now, what you'll find is that when you go to preview your application, you won't actually be able to see any of these stories or accounts from other people. And you'd be surprised by how many people actually watch my tutorials after I've explained to delete this and still message me asking why their application doesn't display their user accounts. This is the reason for that. So before you slide on into my DMs, please, please, please make sure that you have deleted this privacy setting. But from here, I just want to jump back into my data types because now what I'd like to do is actually add in all of the data types I have listed within my Notion checklist. And throughout that process, I'm also going to run through a quick explanation as to why I'm adding each of those in. So over in my Notion doc here, we've already added in our user data type. And one thing I'd recommend is adding in all of your data types before you start building out your data fields. What you'll find is that some of your data fields actually link to separate data types. So you're going to need to add in all of your overarching data types before you can add the relevant fields in. So after our user data type, there was a story data type because of course users will be able to publish stories within our Medium application. So I'm going to create this. Then next on my list, I'm going to scroll on down and we have our story content. And now a quick explanation as to why I've separated the story content from the story is because I'd like to just ensure that we structure our database properly so that it can maintain its speed as we start to register more user accounts and stories in our application. And so within my story data type that we had created, I have a list of relatively light data fields to store in our database. So I'm storing things like the title of the post, the featured image of the post, as well as a number of all of the claps for the post, and even a list of topics that are relevant to that post. But because medium stories can actually be quite long, they can be thousands of words, that's a lot of data to store on a particular entry in your database. And let's say on my home page of Medium, I want to display 100 different stories that someone can scroll through. Every single time a bubble loads a story, it's going to load each individual data field that belongs to it, which is a relatively straightforward process when you're loading just one or even 10 stories. But when you start to load hundreds, if not thousands of stories, if you have the large story text, so the crux of the actual story itself, with let's say five to 10,000 words, Bubble's gonna have to load 100 different versions of all of those long form text fields, which is a sure fast way to quickly slow down the speed of your overall application. And so today what I've done is I've split this into a separate data type. And so whenever I load a list of stories, it's only going to load the lightweight data fields that I have listed here. And then later on, when I'd like to display the full contents of a story, so the actual post itself, I can easily reference the story content data type, which is storing the actual text of that post. And when we build that feature out, I'm going to be sure to explain that in more detail. But for now, I just wanted to highlight the reason as to why I've split this data type into two. So from here, I'm going to jump over into my database and I'm going to create a new data type called story content. I'll create that. Then I'll jump back into my notion checklist and I can see the next data type I want to create is a comment because of course users will be able to create comments in our application and leave those on a post. I will create that there. 
And then finally, the last data type I'd like to add in is going to be a notification. So each time someone either claps or comments on a post, I'd like to create a notification and send that to the person who has published that post. And so I'm gonna open up my data tab once again, and I'm going to add a data type called notification. I will create that. And now back in my Notion doc, that is all of the data fields I'd like to add in. And just as you think you're starting to get the hang of creating your own custom database, I'm gonna throw in a, another complete curveball, which is going to put you off yet again. But of course, I'm gonna be sure to explain everything you need to know. So further down on my list here, I've added another, almost like a data type, which is a list of option sets. And now if you're relatively new to Bubble, you might not be familiar with option sets. And it definitely took me a while to comprehend how I could actually use these when I first started using Bubble myself. But within today's build, they are definitely an essential feature. So I'm gonna be sure to try and explain this in the simplest terms possible. So if I was to open up my Bubble editor here, you can see at this point in time, we have a list of data types. And as I'd previously just mentioned, we're creating a data type for every single thing that a user will create within our app. So whenever a user would like to publish a story, we're going to create an entry in our database, which gives them the ability to create something. However, what if we wanted to have some sort of data in our database that users couldn't create? So let's say we as the admin of our own application would like to create some sort of record to display but we don't want to give our users the ability to touch that data. And the reason why you might not want users to actually have any influence over that is because with users, there's no way you can quality control the way in which that data is entered. So users could add typos, they could mess up the capitalization of words, or they could even just create duplicate records of things that already exist. And this is exactly why you as the admin of your application might want complete control over creating some sort of specific data. And this is what's referred to as option sets. So in our overall menu here in our data tab, I'm gonna open up this list of option sets here. And if you really wanted, you could even watch this helpful tutorial that Bubble uses to explain the concept of option sets. And I assure you, if you watch this tutorial, my feelings will not be hurt. Although I am just gonna give you a quick explanation right now. So what you might see is that our option set here kind of looks like the same process as when you create a data type. So you can see on the left hand side, we're able to create a new thing. And that's because option sets almost are like a data type that only you as the admin of your application can create. And now today I'm creating an option set, which determines a list of topics that people can either register they're interested in or link to any post that they publish. And within this list, you can see I've just added some examples for things like design, marketing, startups, no code, and machine learning. So these are all topics that I, as the admin, am going to create. And our users will only be able to select from these specific topics. They're not gonna be able to create topics of their own because as I mentioned, there's no way to quality assure that users are going to type design exactly like this. They might add, let's say, a lowercase letter, they might add a typo. And then what you'll find is that you start to have duplicate entries within your database. And that is why you as the admin of your application need to have complete control over how you list these topics out. So you can almost think of these as like your single source of truth. And so what I'm gonna do is head over into my bubble editor and I'm going to create an option set called topic. And what you'll now see is that this kind of looks like the same experience as to how you can view and create data fields within each data type. So on the right hand side here, you have all of the data fields within a data type. The same applies for your option set list. So within this, I'm going to create a list of my topics, which are going to be the single source of truth. And these will be the only topics that users can later reference in our application. And so for today, I'm going to type in a list of all of the topics I had in my Notion checklist there. So it was things like design, marketing, startups, machine learning, and no code. 
And if you'd like to add in more topics, feel free to pause this tutorial and add in as many entries as you would like here. I'm just going to keep things relatively simple and straightforward for our MVP today. But now essentially whenever I display a list of topics or allow users to select from topics that they're interested in, what I'm going to do is reference this list here and I can ensure for a fact that they are all going to be spelt the same, there will be no duplicates, and that these are the only topics people can choose from, which means that users can't create just random topics that aren't relevant to our product today. And so that is the power of option sets. You can definitely do a lot more complex things with option sets inside a bubble, but I'm not going to overwhelm us with that today. I think just learning about this concept is already enough to grasp. But from here, there is one last thing we'll need to do in our database, and that is build out all of the relevant data fields within each data type. So as I mentioned, for every single entry that a user creates in our database, we're going to need to store some data that's relevant to that. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to walk through each of our data types and I'm going to explain why I've added in each data field. So we're going to jump over into bubble and we're going to open up our user data type. I'm going to create a new field here, which is called the name. And this of course will be a text field type because someone's name is just two words put together as text. Nice and simple. I'll create that. Then I'd like to add another field, which is called the bio, which once again, will just be a standard text field because users can store almost like a small description about themselves on their profile. Then from here, I'd like to create another field and register a profile photo for a user. And now one little personal preference I should point out is that when I'm creating my data fields, I like to just separate the words using a dash. And the reason I do that is because when I store my data types, I separate those with a space. And then when I create my data fields, I separate those with the dash. So that way I can easily tell the two apart whenever I'm working in my actual editor later on. But for our profile photo field type, as you probably guessed, this field type is going to be an image because of course someone will need to upload a photo to display on their account. I'm going to create this. Then from here, I would like to create a way for a user to determine what topics they're interested in. And you can absolutely bet that we're going to reference that list of option sets we had just recently created. So I'm going to create a field here and I'm going to call this interested dash topics. And I would like to link this data field to our list of option sets that we just created, which is referred to as topic. And because a user can have more than one topic that they're interested in, I'd like them to be able to select from our whole list of topics. And so what we can do is select this option here to make this a field with multiple entries. So that way a user can be interested in design, startups, machine learning, however many topics they would like. I'll choose to create this. And then following on from that, we're going to create another list as well. And in this case, I'm going to create a list of all of the followers that this person has. So I'll create a field. I will call this followers. And for this field type, what I'd like to do is set this as a list of users. So essentially every single time someone follows a user on our platform, I would like to add that person to the list of total people who are following that particular user. And so for our field type here, I'm actually going to scroll on down and link this to our existing user data type. And then I'm going to select that this should be a list with multiple entries because a user can have more than one follower. I'll choose to create this. And what I love about Bubble is that it truly allows you to create a relational database, which in simple terms just means you can connect all of the information together. So let's say I want to display the information of a particular person that follows a user in our application. Because this data field is linked to our user data type, it's going to allow me to pull all of the information for a specific person. So I could easily reference the person's name, their profile photo, or even their bio. And we will be doing that later on today. So I can't wait to show you that in a later module. While we're here though, what I'd like to do is create another list of all of the people that a user is following. So I'm going to create a new field. I'll call this following. 
And as you probably guessed, this is going to be linked to our user data type. And of course, this is going to be a list with multiple entries. I will create that. And on the topic of creating lists, I'm going to create one more. And that is just going to be a list of all of a user saved or bookmarked stories. So every single time someone wants to add a story to their bookmark list, so maybe they could view it later, or maybe it was just a great read that they want to reference later on in the future. We're going to create a feature today that allows them to save that to a dedicated list. So we're going to create a new field here, and I'm going to call this field saved stories. I will then have this field type be linked to, as you probably guessed, our story data type. And I'd like to create a list so that way a user can save more than one story to their overall list of saved stories. I'll choose to create this. And now there's one last data field I'll be storing in my user's account. And that is just a way to determine if the user is a paid subscriber. And so later on in our tutorial, we're going to be building out a paywall feature that's going to gate content if a user is not a paid subscriber to our application. And so in order to create that experience, we're just going to need to store some details about whether or not the user is in fact a paid subscriber. So I'm going to create a new field here and I'm going to call this paid dash subscriber. And for this field, I'm going to set this as a yes, no value. So a user will in fact be a paid subscriber or they will not be a paid subscriber. And then later on when I create my paywall, I can display that to all of the users who are not paid subscribers. I will then create this. Only one thing I'm going to do here is that I'm going to update the default value of this field to be no. So by default, as soon as someone registers an account, they're going to be registered as someone who is not a paid subscriber. And they won't be a paid subscriber until they pull out their credit card and process a transaction to sign up, in which case we will update this field to then be yes. So that way we know not to show the paywall to that user. For now though, that's everything we'll need to add into our user data type. Let's jump on over into our Notion checklist and just tick all of those data fields off. I'm then gonna scroll on down to our story data type. So similar to our users, whenever a story is created, I'm gonna to want to store some information about it. So I'm gonna jump over into my bubble editor, open up our story data type, and the first thing I'm going to add is a field called title, which is almost like the name of the story. This is just going to be a plain text field. I'll choose to create that. Then for this story, I'd also like to save a featured image. So this is almost like the profile photo for the story. So of course I'd like to display an image which is just going to entice someone to click through and view the full details of that story. And I'll once again be setting this field type to just be an image. And because you can only store one image as a thumbnail, I'm not going to select that that should be a list with multiple entries. I'll then create this. And now for every story that we display on our homepage or our search results page today, what I'd like to do is not only display the title and the featured image, but I also want to display just a small snippet of text, which is just going to be the preview text for that story. And this is just essentially going to be the first 100 characters of that post. And this will just prompt someone to actually click through and view the full post. And so what I'm going to do is create a field and I'm going to call this preview text. I'll then set this field type to be a plain text field, nice and simple. And then of course, whenever someone publishes a story, I'd like them to link a list of relevant topics to this story. And so what I'm going to do is once again, reference that option set list that we had created. So I'm going to create a new field here and I'll be calling this field topics. And once again, we will reference the topic option set. And because a story can be linked to multiple topics, I am in fact going to select that this should be a list with multiple entries. And then from here, I'm going to create another data field and I'm going to call this field the claps field. So on Medium, if you're familiar with the real world product, users can leave claps on a story. This is kind of like the like functionality on other platforms like Facebook or Instagram. Medium just refers to it as claps though. And in this case, I'm going to store this as a number because I'm going to want to count the number of claps that a story has received. And so I'm going to call this field claps. 
and I'll set the field type to be a number. And later on, when we build this feature out, I'm going to explain how we can add a number to this every single time a clap button is clicked. I'll choose to create this though for now. And then finally, there's two last fields I'd like to add in. One field is going to be called is published. And I'm going to set this as a yes, no type. And so whenever someone's writing a story, there's no guaranteeing that they're going to immediately publish that straight away. If you've ever written a story on Medium in the past, you might know that it takes a little while to actually draft a post because it can be quite long. And so whenever we create a story in our database, by default, we're not going to want to actually publish that immediately. We're only going to want to publish it whenever someone notifies that they are in fact happy to publish it. Or if they're not ready to, they're going to save it as a draft. And so that's why I have this field in our database today to recognize if the story should be published or it should not. I'm going to create this and I actually won't need to set a default value on this particular field. I'll explain how we can build this out later on though when we walk through the module where we create our first story. And then finally, the very last field I'll be adding into our story data type is going to be referred to as the content. So this is the actual post of the story itself. So the long form text article. And in this case, if you remember, I had separated the story content as a separate data type. So I'm going to link this field to our story content. And because only one long form bit of text can link to one story, I will not be selecting that that is a field with multiple entries. I'll choose to create this for now. Then we can jump back into Notion and check off that we're finished adding in all of the fields for our story data type. And we're almost at the end of our process for the database build. The next data field I want to add in is within our story content. You can see this one's very straightforward. And so I'm going to open up my bubble editor here, open up our story content data type. And within this, I'm only going to store one field and that is just the actual text of the story itself. So I'm going to set this field type to be text. I will create that. Then I can just jump back into my notion doc and check that off. The next two fields we're going to add are within our comment data type. So whenever a comment is created, I'm just going to open up my comment data type. There's two things I would like to store. There's the actual content of the comment, which is just the text that is sent within a comment. And then I want to link each comment back to a story that it was published against. So that way later on, I can display a list of all of the comments that belong to that story. So I'm going to create my first field here, and I'm going to call this the content of the comment. And this is just going to be a text field. So as I mentioned, that is the actual text itself that someone posts within a comment. And then finally, as I said, I'm going to link this comment back to an original story. So I'm going to call this field OG story, and I'm going to set the field type to be a story, which is linked to our data type. And of course, because only one comment can link to one story, I'm not going to select that that should be a list with multiple entries. I'll just create that as a single entry. Then I'm going to jump back into Notion, tick those off, and the very last series of data fields we need to add in is within our notification data type. So I'm going to jump back into my database, open up our notification data type. And within our notification data type, the first thing I'd like to do is just register what type of notification this is going to be. So is it going to be a notification that's created based on when someone claps on a story? Or is it going to be a notification that's created whenever someone comments on a story? And so what I'm going to do is create a data field called is clap. You can see I just made a typo there. And this field type will be set as a yes, no option because it is going to be a clap or it's not going to be a clap. I will create this. And then I'd like to create a similar data field called is comment, which is once again going to be a yes, no field type because this is going to be a notification for a comment or it's not. I will create this. And then for every notification, what I'd like to do is link this to the story in which this engagement activity occurred on. So if someone leaves a clap on a story, I'm going to want to obviously send that to a user and just notify them which story has received that engagement. 
So similar to our comment data type, I'm going to create a field called OG story. And this is once again, going to link to an individual story. So our story data type, I'll choose to create this. And then finally, because of course, we're going to need to send a notification to a particular user. What we're going to do is create a separate field here called receiving user. And so this is going to be the person who should receive this notification. And this field type, as you could probably guess by now, is going to be linked to our user data type. And because only one notification will be sent to one user at a time, I am not going to tick that this is a list of multiple entries. And just like that, I'm going to jump back into my Notion doc, check off all of those data fields. And that concludes everything we'll need to add into our database. I can also tick off my option set list there. As you can see, it's never been easier to build your own custom database entirely from scratch using Bubble's no code tool. As I mentioned at the start of this section in our tutorial, I know this can be a little bit overwhelming, which is why I like to personally write everything down in a notion doc before I actually touch my bubble editor, as it just ensures that I can clearly comprehend how my application is going to function and it fit together nicely. After building out our database, I want to move on to the list of features that I have set out for us in our product today. And as you can see, this list is quite long as there is quite a bit that I would like to cover. The very first thing I want to jump into though, is just walking you through the process of how you can actually register a new user's account. Because of course, before someone can actually use our medium application, they're going to need to register an account. And thankfully, this is a relatively straightforward process inside of bubble. So what we're going to do is we're just going to jump over into our bubble edits that we've created here. And we're going to actually create a new page in our application, which users can sign up an account from. So in order to add a new page, I'm going to head to the drop down menu in the left hand side of my screen here, and I'll select to add a new page. I'll be calling this the register page. I'll choose to create this. And now on this page, the very first thing I'd like to do is double click on this so I can open up my element inspector here. And just a personal preference that I have when I'm actually building my application is that I like to update the background color just to be a very light shade of gray. And now the reason I do that is so that way I can see where the actual page sits in my overall bubble editor here. And of course, when you go to preview or publish your application at any later point in the future, you can always update this to be a white background once again. But just for the time being, I'm going to set this to be a light shade of gray. I'm then also going to need to jump over into my layout tab as I'll need to identify what container layout style I'd like to set for this page. And now if you're relatively new to bubble, a container layout just refers to the way in which you'll be placing elements or items on your page. And if you were to open up this drop down menu here, you'll see that there's four options, which can sometimes be a little confusing if you are brand new to using this no code tool. However, there is good news. And that is that between all of these four options, there's only ever two that I personally ever really use. And that is the row or the column option. And the difference between the two is that a column container layout allows you to place elements on your page from top to bottom. So if you were to add three elements onto your page, these would all be stacked on top of each other, as I mentioned, vertically from top to bottom. Whereas the row container layout option allows you to stack your elements side by side, so horizontally. So let's say if I was to add those three same elements onto my page, instead of them being stacked on top of each other, they would be placed directly beside each other. And now when it comes to almost every website and application, what you'll notice is that when you view a page, you view this from top to bottom, and it's the same process as when you build a page. So whenever I'm creating a page within my bubble editor, I'll almost always use the column option just so that way I can stack elements from top to bottom. Of course, there will be instances in our tutorial today where I'll want to stack elements horizontally across our page. But thankfully, Bubble allows you to add a group element onto your page, which is almost like a little page inside of your overall page, which then gives you the option to customize its container layout. So in an overall page where you're stacking elements from top to bottom, you can have sections that stack from side to side. 
And I don't want to confuse you with too many options right now. We'll cross that bridge when we get there and I'll be sure to explain it in as much detail as I can. But for the time being, we've now taken the time to just update the background color of our page. I've also selected that any element I add onto this page, I want it to be stacked from top to bottom. And so what I'd like to do now is add the very first element onto our page. And in this instance, it's just going to be a heading at the top of our page. So I'm gonna to head to my visual elements tab here and I'm gonna to select to add a text element onto my page. I can click to add this anywhere on my page and as you'll see, it'll be positioned in the top left-hand corner by default. And within this text element, I just want this to display the words join medium. And so on our registration page, this is just going to be a small little heading. And now when it comes to this text element here, before I update the position of it on our page, I'm going to edit the style of this so it looks more like the actual heading that's displayed on the real world medium application. And so I'm gonna scroll on down to my style menu here. And as you can see, it's currently just using a default style that Bubble has provided us with. What I'd like to do is choose to remove this style here because I'd like to customize this text myself. And when it comes to the font of this text, I'm going to open up our drop down menu here and I'm gonna select the Balthaza font. And then after selecting the font, I'm going to update the font size to be 30. And as you'll see, it looks more like a heading now. I'll also center align this text in the center of the actual element itself. And then of course, I'm gonna to need to center the overall element into the center of my page. And so in order to update the position settings for this element, I'm gonna head over to the layout tab of my element inspector here. And this will allow me to control how this element is positioned on my page, as well as how it responds to a browser size. So that's when we can start to create a responsive experience. So for example, if a user reduces the size of their device or if they're viewing it on a mobile, we obviously want this to react and be responsive accordingly. And so what I'm gonna do when it comes to the layout tab here is head on down to the width of this element. So the width is how much space this element's gonna take across our overall page. And as you can see here, there's an option selected to make this element a fixed width of 200 pixels, which just means that regardless of how big or small our page becomes, this element will always take up 200 pixels in width on our page. And when I'm working with text elements, I try to avoid making things a fixed width, just because what you'll find if I jump over to my responsive menu here, is that if you were to reduce the page and the element is a fixed width, it's just going to cut that text off. And this is probably a bad example to show you because a page will never actually get down to 200 pixels in width. As you can see, the very smallest size it will ever become is 320 pixels. And to be honest, most mobile devices these days allow you to display 380 pixels. But what I just wanna do is show you how I would make this element responsive to ensure best practices. So what I'm gonna do is jump back over into my UI builder, which was the editor that we were just within. And then if I open up the layout tab for my heading once again, what I'm gonna do is unselect that this element should be fixed width. And what you'll now see is that I have the option to add in a minimum and a maximum width for this element. And so if I was to set the minimum width of this element to be zero and leave the maximum width of this to be infinite, what this essentially means is that this element will take up as little or as much space on our page as it is allowed to. And so if I now jump back over into my responsive menu one more time, you'll see that the element is fully responsive across our page, regardless of how big or small it becomes. And even if we were to collapse this page down, the text itself would just stack on top of itself. And so as you can see, this is how you can create a fully responsive experience. And when it comes to most elements that you add onto your page within Bubble, you'll be following this exact process in order to make your whole application functional. I'll of course be showing you more examples of this as we add all of our elements onto our page. The only other setting I'd like to change is just the height for this element. So at this point in time, it has a minimum height of zero. But what I can see is that we have an option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content within it. And so what that means is that if I was to set the minimum height here to be zero, and this option is selected, this text element would collapse around the text inside of it and make sure that it allows all of this text to be displayed without taking up any more additional space on our page. And as you can see, that's how we can add our text heading onto our page here. 
I'm going to jump back into my UI builder once again and jump back into my layout tab. And from here, the only other thing I'd like to change on this text element is just the margin that it has at the top. So if I was to add 50 pixels of margin, what you'll now see is that this element is pushed down on our page, which means it's no longer touching the top border of our overall page. And now after we've added our heading onto the page, I'm going to add in a series of input fields, which will allow a user to add in some information that I'm going to later on store inside of our database. And so when a user registers an account, I'd like to register their name, their email, and their password, which they can of course use to log into their application at a later point in time. And so in order to store this information, I'm going to scroll on down in my elements menu here to my input forms tab. I'm going to choose to add a regular input field onto my page. And as you can see, when I added this element onto my page, it sits below our text heading. And that is because if you remember on our overall page, we had set the container layout to be a column, which as I'd mentioned, allows you to stack elements on top of each other. And so that's why it's now creating this experience that we want. And when it comes to this input field here, I'm going to start by clicking on the name of it at the top of our element inspector. I'm going to update this to be called input name. So that way when I create a workflow to register the information that a user has added into this input field, I can easily reference which field I'd like to pull that value from. I'm then also going to jump over into my appearance tab here and I'll update the placeholder text that's displayed within my input field just to display the word name. So placeholder text is essentially just the word that's going to display inside of this input field up until a user actually clicks inside this field and adds in a value of their own. And that's everything I'll need to add in this particular input field. While we have our element inspector open though, what I'd like to do is just update the styling of this input field as well. So if I was to click away from this, as you can see, it has a solid border that tracks around every single edge of this input field. Whereas if you had recently registered an account within Medium's real world product, what you'd know is that it doesn't actually have a border around the input field. It only just has a flat line at the bottom to indicate that this is in fact an input field. And that's actually an experience we can easily replicate within our application today. So what I'm gonna do is actually choose to edit the style of the input field here. I'm not gonna remove the style like we did with our text. Instead, I'm gonna to choose to edit the existing style. And if you're not familiar with styles, they allow you to create a design pattern that you can use and reference across multiple pages within your application. And so for our text element here, I just selected to remove the style of this and create a one-off styling for this text element, just because I'm never again throughout my application going to create a heading that's this particular font, that's also this particular size. Whereas with our input fields, there's gonna be multiple sections in our application where I'm gonna to want to leverage the custom style I'm about to add onto this input field. And so the purpose of a style is that instead of designing it every single time you want to reference a particular design pattern, what you can do is just choose to create it once and then you can easily reference it at any given point in time. So it's just gonna save you a whole lot of time having to redesign it. And so what I'm gonna do is choose to edit the style of this input field. And you'll now see that we have the ability to edit all of these settings like we had before. When it comes to this particular input field, what I'm interested in changing is the border around it. So as I mentioned, I only want there to be a border across the bottom line of our input field, not around every single edge. So I'm gonna to choose to define each border independently here. And then I'm gonna set the top border to be none, the right border to be none, the bottom border to be solid, so I'm gonna leave that as is, and then the left side border to also be none. And then I'm also going to scroll on up and update the background style to be none, so it won't have a color in the background, as you could just see. And so if I was to now jump back into my design tab and click away from this element, what you'll now see is that we just have the placeholder text followed by a single line below it, which is the exact experience I wanted to create. And now when it comes to the layout settings of our input field, we're also gonna need to update that in order to display this input field in the center of our page, just like the text element we've added above it. So if I head to my input field here, open up my layout tab, what I'd like to do is start by horizontally aligning this element in the center of my page. 
I'm also then going to unselect that this element should be a fixed width. I'm going to set the minimum width to be zero. But instead of leaving the maximum width is infinite, as you can see on my page here, what I'd like to do is give this a limited maximum width. So because the maximum width is in fact infinite, this element knows that it can stretch across as far as it wants on my page, which will technically make it responsive because if I was to expand or contract my page, as you can see, this element is in fact being completely responsive. But what I'd like to do is just restrict the overall width of this element just so it's not so wide. And so if I was to set a maximum width of 400 pixels, what you'll now see is that this element is completely responsive. So if I was to reduce the width of my page below 400 pixels, it would continually scale down. However, if I was to expand this element beyond 400 pixels, this element won't continue to increase in size, which is the purpose of the maximum width here. And now when it comes to the height settings, I'm just gonna leave this as the default option. So at this point in time, this input field has a fixed height of 45 pixels. So that just means that regardless of whatever happens on our page, this element will remain this exact height, which is an experience I'd like to create. And then finally, I'm just going to head to our margins and add in 20 pixels of margin at the top. I won't add any on the bottom, but I'm also gonna add in 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And the reason why I'm adding the margins on both sides of this element is because if I reduce the width of my page here, I just wanna make sure that this element doesn't touch the borders of my page. So as you'll see, it'll always have some space between the actual page border itself. And that's everything I'll need to add for this particular input field. If I was to jump back into my UI builder though, what I'd like to do is add two additional fields onto this page. One to register the user's email and another to register the user's password. And the easiest way to add in those input fields is just by creating a copy of my existing one here. So I'm going to create a copy here. I'll select on my page and paste that in. And what you'll see is that when I paste this input field across, it's going to have all of the exact same settings as the original input field we had created. And now when it comes to this particular input field, I'm going to update the name of this to be called input email. I'll update the placeholder text to also be email. And now we'll also need to make one last change to this input field. And that is that if you see the content format that we're storing within this input field, so that's just the type of value that a user will add into this field. It's currently set as a text option, whereas I'd like this to store a value of a valid email address. When we select this, that's just going to ensure that Bubble will only allow a user to add in a valid email address format. So something like their email address at gmail.com or at their own website.com. And this is essential whenever you're registering someone's account within Bubble. Finally, I'm gonna make one last copy of this field here. I'm gonna update the name of this to be called input password. I'll update the placeholder text to be password. And I'll also update the content format to be a password, which just ensures that any characters added in this are just going to be displayed as dots. So the password is going to be hidden, which is the exact experience we want to create. And just like that, that is all of the input fields I'd like to add onto this page. From here, I'm gonna to choose to add a button element onto my page below this. And this button will display the word register. And of course, when this button is clicked, we're going to create our very first workflow, which will allow us to register someone's account within our database. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is choose to edit the style of this button. And I'm going to actually choose to edit the primary button style just because I'm gonna to want to reference the design settings I'm about to add across multiple pages within my app. So instead of having to redesign each individual button, I'm just going to edit the style once and then I can easily reference that at any given point in the future. So I'm gonna to choose to edit the style of the button here. And when it comes to this style, I'm just gonna change a few quick things. I'm gonna update the background style, which is a flat color to be a different color code. I have a shade of green here that is the same green used on medium itself. If you'd like that color code, it's 1A8917. And then finally, I'm just gonna scroll on down to the roundness of the borders on this button, and I'll update this to be 20, just so that way it has some curved edges around the button itself. 
And that is everything I'll need to change within the style. So I'm going to jump back to my design tab here. And of course, I'd like to center this button in the middle of my page. So in order to do that, I'm going to need to open up my layout tab. I'd like to horizontally align this in the center of my page here. Now, when it comes to the width of the button, I'm just going to leave this as the fixed width option, just because I'll only ever want my button to be 150 pixels in width. So regardless of how small or large my page becomes, it's always going to be this exact size. And it's the same with our height. I'm going to leave the default option as is because I'm quite happy with the height there. The only other thing I'm going to change is that I'd like to add in 20 pixels of margin at the top of this element here. And just like that, that is everything I'd like to add onto this page. What we can now do is choose to build out a workflow that's going to run whenever this button is clicked. In which case, I'd like to register someone's account within our database. So I'm going to select to start a workflow whenever this button is clicked. And within this workflow, I'm going to add our very first action. And I'm going to select from the account options. And I'd like to select to sign a user up. And as you'll see, what we'll need to do is register a valid email address and password for this user's account. And of course, the value I'd like to store in our database for the user's email is going to be the value of the input email on my page. And it's at this point you can start to see where those naming conventions are going to come into play because I can easily reference the correct input field. For the password, I'd like this to be the input password field. And what I also love about Bubble is that when you register someone's new account, you can select this option here to change any additional data fields that you'd like to store within their account. And in this case, I'd like to register one additional field, and that is going to be the user's name. I'd like this to equal the value of the input name on our page. And at this point in time, if a user was to land on our registration page, select to register a new account, that workflow would run and their account would in fact be created. But what you'd find is that the user would just remain static on this page. So they might not know if that workflow has successfully ran. What I'd like to do is add an additional step onto my workflow that identifies once someone's account has been registered, we're going to redirect them through to another page in our app. And I'd like that page to be the settings page because once someone has created an account, I'd like them to be able to store any additional information they'd like within that account. And so what I'm going to do is head over to my workflow tab here. And with our first workflow here where we had registered a user's new account, I'm going to add an additional step on here and I'm going to select from the navigation event. I'll select the go to page action. And from here, Bubble's just going to need to identify which page in our app we'd like to send the user through to. And at this point, our settings page does not yet exist. So we're going to need to create this from scratch. So I'll choose to create a new page. I'll call this the settings page. I'll create that. And now in my destination drop down, you'll see that I can reference that settings page. It's as simple as that. And that's actually everything I'd like to add within our workflow. And it also concludes everything I wanted to build out in this particular section of our tutorial. Let's jump on over into a preview of our application and take a look at what this whole experience is now going to look like. If you're new to Bubble, you can preview your app by selecting the preview option here and it will load the application for you. And as you can see on my registration page, I have all of my input fields here. I'm going to choose to add my name into this field. I'll add a test email address into my email field. And I'll just add a test password, which as you'll see, all of those characters are hidden for. I'll then choose to register an account here. Our workflow will run and it's going to not only sign up a new account within our database, but it's also going to redirect me through to my settings page, as you can see within my URL here. And of course, this settings page is currently blank, so there's nothing on it, but we'll be building that out later on in our tutorial today. But from here, what I'm going to do is just jump back into my Notion checklist and tick off that we've finished building out the feature to register new user accounts, which of course is essential for any application where users are going to be storing their own information. At this point in our tutorial, I wanted to move along to one of the first real core features we're going to build out today. And that is the home page that's going to display a feed of stories to a user. So these will be the stories published by people that the user follows. 
as well as a list of recommended stories that are published by people that the user does not follow. And now when it comes to building out the homepage, there is quite a bit involved throughout this process. So I'm going to be sure to explain everything I can in as much detail as possible, just so that way it helps simplify the whole process on your end. And so to kick things off, we're going to start by jumping over into our bubble editor here. And within our editor, you may have noticed that by default, Bubble provides you with a page called an index page. And at this point in time, this page is currently blank within our application. And now the index page acts as the home page within your application. So this is the core page that users will automatically be sent to as soon as your application is loaded. And so what we're going to be doing is building out the home page on our index page here. And before I add any elements onto this page, what I'm going to do is just update the background color, which again, is just a personal preference I have. I'm just gonna set this to be a light shade of gray, so that way I can actually see where it sits within my overall bubble editor here. Of course, when I go to preview or publish my application, I can change that back at any given point. I'm also then gonna to need to jump over into my layout tab here because I'm gonna to need to update the way in which this page is structured. And now when it comes to the home page itself within Medium, I'm gonna be adding quite a few different blocks onto this page. And these are all gonna be positioned horizontally across our page. And the best way to illustrate this is just by showing you an example that I previously built in the past. So within a separate browser here, I just have a rough example of what we're gonna be building out today. Now everything on this is currently color coded, so it probably just looks like a bright ice cream cake. However, I just wanted to illustrate what exactly we're going to be building throughout this step in our tutorial. So on our homepage here, you'll notice that on the left-hand side, we have a main navigation menu, like the real world medium product. Then beside this, we have a repeating group, which is going to display a list of all of these stories based on whether someone wants to view these stories that people they're following have published, or if they wanna see a list of recommended stories. And then on the right-hand side, we're gonna have a search menu, which is just going to allow someone to search through a list of related topics, or even type in a search query themselves, in which case we'll later on be redirecting them through to a dedicated search results page. And so as you can see, all of these elements are positioned side by side on each other. But one thing I'd like to show you is that if I was to reduce the width of this existing example I've created, what I've done is I've created a couple of conditions that hide certain groups based on how much space I can fit on this page. And what you'll see is that when the page it becomes so small that it can no longer fit on my left-hand menu here, that menu is going to instead appear down the bottom of my page. And the reason I'm showing you this is because contrary to what you might think in that all of my elements are positioned side by side on our page, you may have thought that the container layout for this page would need to be set as a row because I'm stacking elements horizontally. Whereas in fact, what I've actually done on this page is I've still set the container layout to be a column, but as you can see, I've added a group onto this page, which is just this light purple group here. And I've set the container layout of that to be a row. So that way I can stack my elements horizontally. And then below that, I've added in a menu that's going to be displayed whenever the page is below a certain width. And so technically I have stacked this page like a column. So all of the elements have been stacked on top of each other, so vertically. And so when it comes to the container layout for our build today, I'm gonna set this to be a column. And then as I mentioned, the first thing I'm going to do on this page is just add a group element onto it, which will be set as a row. So I'm gonna head to my containers menu here and I'll select to add a group onto it. Before I make any changes to the responsive settings of this group, I am just going to jump to the appearance tab though. And as I've shown you in the past, a personal preference of mine is that I like to color code any groups I add onto my page. I know it can sometimes look a little bit abstract like the example I've shown you here. Everything looks just like someone's assembled a ton of different Lego pieces that don't belong with each other. But that's exactly what I wanna create. When I'm creating a bubble application, things are confusing enough as is. So what I wanna do is clearly color code where all my groups sit. And of course, when I go to preview or publish my application, I can always update the colors to be white or have no color at all. 
But for the time being, when I'm working on my products, I always like to color code things just so I know where everything sits on my page. And so in this case, I'm just gonna remove the default style of this particular group. And I'm gonna give it a flat background color. And I'm gonna make this a light shade of blue here, similar to what I'd done with my previous example I'd just shown you. Then I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab and update the container layout of this group to be a row. So that way, whatever elements sit within this group are gonna be positioned side by side, so horizontally across our page. I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width to zero, leaving the maximum width is infinite, which just of course means that regardless of how small or large my page becomes, this group is going to be completely responsive. I'll then jump over into my UI builder once again. And now within this group, as I've just shown you before, there's a couple of different elements I wanna add into it. On the left-hand side, there's going to be a navigation menu. And then in this particular section of our tutorial, we're only gonna be building out the main feed, which is going to display a list of posts. And now in order to add in my navigation menu, I'm gonna to need to add yet another group within my existing group. Because if you remember from the example I had previously shown you here, all of the elements that sit within this red group here are stacked vertically, not horizontally. And so what I'll need to do is add a group within my existing blue group that's going to have a container layout of a column. And now one thing I would just like to point out is that instead of adding the group on our page here, what I'm gonna do is create what's called a reusable element. And reusable elements are kind of like design styles for particular elements in Bubble that you want to reference more than once. So because I want to add that exact same navigation menu across almost every single page within my application today, what I can do is instead of having to recreate it on every single page, I can create it once as a reusable element, and then I can easily just install that element on any single page at any given point that I would like. So that way I build it once and then I can show it as many times as I'd like instead of having to build it a number of different times every single time I want to reference a navigation menu. And when it comes to reusable elements, this can be a little bit confusing, particularly if you are new to Bubble. So I'm going to walk you through the whole process. What you might find is that if you were to scroll on down in your elements menu here, right at the bottom, you'll see there's an option to add in some reusable elements. And so if we were to create a reusable element like a navigation menu, we'll be able to see this element here and just drag it directly onto our page without having to edit it on our page itself. And so in order to create a reusable element, we're gonna open up our drop down menu here and you'll see the option to add a new reusable element. And in this case, I'm just gonna call this my left hand menu because this is the menu that's always gonna be positioned on the left hand side of my page. I'm gonna to choose to create this. And then what you'll see is that we're gonna be redirected through to almost like another page within our editor that's going to allow us to actually build out this particular element. And so this is where we're going to build the element once and then we're gonna easily be able to reference it within our actual home page. So as you can see within our page menu here, we're currently not viewing our home page anymore. We're viewing the left-hand menu, which is just an element. And when it comes to the process of designing this particular element, what I'm gonna do is jump to my appearance tab. And the first thing I'm gonna do is actually color code this. So that way when I add it onto my page, I know exactly where it sits. So I'm just gonna update this to be a light shade of red. Then I'm going to jump over into my layout tab and I'll update the container layout to be a column, which is going to allow me to stack elements on top of each other. I am gonna come back and update all of my width and height settings in a moment. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is start adding all of the elements I'd like to display within this particular menu. And the first element I want to add is just going to be a medium logo. So this is just going to be a single image. So if I scroll on up to my visual elements here, I'm gonna to select to add an image into my red group. I'm then gonna to choose to upload a static image just because on my own local device here, I have an image that I've saved from Google Images. And then once I've uploaded my image, as you can see, it is quite large. So what I'm gonna to need to do is jump over into my layout tab and I'm going to update the width of this image to be 60 pixels. And I am gonna keep this as a fixed width because I'm always gonna want it to be this wide regardless of how wide or small my page is. 
What I am going to do as well is just choose to keep this elements aspect ratio fixed, which just means if it is a one to one ratio, it's going to make it 60 pixels by 60 pixels. And now you can see that that's fitting in the full medium logo there. I'm then going to choose to horizontally align this element in the center of my red group here. And then the last thing I'd like to change is that I just want to add in 20 pixels of margin at the top of this element. So that way it doesn't touch the top border of the particular group itself. And now once I've added my medium logo in, what I'd like to do is add a series of icon elements, which are just going to prompt a user to click on those. And when they are clicked on, I'm going to be redirecting that user through to the page in which they'd like to view. And so under my visual elements, I can see that we have the ability to add in an icon element. So I'm going to select to add an icon in here. And the very first icon I'm going to search for is going to be a home. So I'm just going to select this little home icon here. What I'm also going to do is choose to edit the style of this icon. So it's currently a blue color. What I'd like to do is make this a darker shade of black. And because I'd like every single icon I add into my application to be that particular color, instead of just creating a one off color, what I'm going to do is choose to actually edit the icon style here. And then I can easily reference that whenever I'd like to make sure that an icon is that specific color. So I'm going to choose to edit the style of our standard icon style. I'm then going to head to our icon color and I'm going to paste in a color code I have here. If you'd like that color code, it's 4D, 4D, 4D. I'm then going to choose to jump back into my design tab because what I'd like to do now is head over to my layout option here and update the design settings for this icon. So I'm going to start by updating the width of this icon to be 30 pixels and the height to also be 30 pixels. And I'm going to keep both of these options as fixed values because I'm only ever going to want my icon to be this specific size regardless of how big or small my page becomes. I won't want it to increase or decrease in style. So if I keep these options ticked, it's going to ensure that it's always going to be 30 by 30. I'm then going to align this element in the center of my red group. And then finally, I'm going to add in 50 pixels of margin at the top, just so that way it is spaced away from my medium logo there. And now below this icon, what I'm going to do is add in yet another but in order to streamline that whole process, I'm going to copy this icon, select my red group and choose to paste that in. The only change we're going to make here though, is that I want the top margin to be 20 pixels, not 50, because I'd like this icon to be closer to our first one. And then of course, I'm going to need to update the icon itself. And in this case, I'd like this icon to be a bell icon. And so I'm going to select the empty bell icon here. And this icon, when clicked, will redirect a user through to a notifications page. And then below this, I'm going to make yet another copy of my icon here. Only in this instance, I'm going to search for a bookmark icon. I'll select the empty bookmark option. And of course, when this is clicked, it's going to send someone through to a bookmark page, which we're going to build that workflow out in a moment. But before we do that, I'm going to need to add in a couple of additional icons. So I'm going to make another copy of this. Only this time I'm going to add in a newspaper icon and this is going to be used to send someone through to their dashboard page where they can manage a list of all of their stories. Then I'm going to make yet another copy here. And in this case, I'm going to search for the pencil icon and I'm going to select this icon here, which looks like it'll allow someone to create a new story. When it comes to this icon though, what I would like to do is jump over into my layout tab. And if we're going to replicate the same menu as the real world medium product, I'm going to need to space this icon a little further down within my group. So I'm going to give it 50 pixels of margin at the top. So that way these initial icons are clustered together. And that way this one, it seems a little bit more important because it's going to be on its own. And then finally, the very last thing I'd like to do is add in a user's profile photo that when clicked is going to send someone through to their settings page. And so what we're gonna do here is add in a profile photo, which is gonna be an image, not an icon. So I'm gonna to select to add an image element into my existing red group. I'm going to insert dynamic data. And in this case, I want to display the current user. So that is the person who's logged into their account. I'd like to display their profile photo. And just a personal preference I have is that when it comes to displaying profile photos in circle images, I also like to select the more option 
and choose the process with Imgix choice, which when I tick to resize the dimensions by cropping this image, it just allows the image to be displayed fully within the actual circle itself. And so I'm gonna to choose to close this data source and then I'll update the styling of this image. And so when it comes to this image, I'm gonna set the roundness of this to be 100. So that way it becomes a perfect circle. When I'm working on images, I also like to add a solid border around them so I can actually see where it lies within our page. I'll then need to update the size of this image. So I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab here. And when it comes to this image, I'm going to set the width as 40 pixels. And I'm going to tick that I'd like to keep this elements aspect ratio fixed. So now it's gonna be 40 pixels by 40 pixels. And so that means it's just gonna be a little bit bigger than our icon elements, which were 30 pixels. I'm then going to move this to the next position within my group. So that way it sits below my last icon. I'll also align this in the center of my group. And I'll add in 50 pixels of margin at the top and 100 pixels of margin at the bottom. And what you'll now see is that this is once again spaced out from the rest of the icons and the bottom of our group here. And now that's everything I'd like to add within our menu group here. So what I'm gonna do before we build out the workflows to make this navigation feature functional, I'm going to actually select on the red group itself and I'm going to update the minimum height and width values of this element. And so as you can see right now, the width of this element in our UI builder is currently 200 pixels. However, because it has no minimum width or maximum width, if I was to open up my responsive menu here, this element would continually scale up or down, regardless of how wide the page is. Whereas that's not the experience I wanna create. I wanna create an experience where it is consistently a certain size, and I'm only gonna want it to be about this big, which is actually 80 pixels. And so if I was to update the width of our UI builder here to be 80 pixels, it's going to allow the element to look like it's 80 pixels within our editor. However, if I continually expand this up and down, it's still going to become larger or smaller. And so what I'm gonna do is set the maximum width here to be 80 pixels. And what you'll now find is that if I was to drag this page out, it actually doesn't allow it to become any wider than 80 pixels in total. And then what I'm also gonna do while we're here is just update the minimum height. I'm gonna set this to be 600 pixels, which will just ensure that it takes up this much space on my home page or whatever page I add this element to. And that's everything I'd like to update in terms of the styling of this particular group. If I jump back into my UI builder though, what I'd like to do is actually build out the workflows that are going to run whenever these icon elements are clicked. And so whenever someone clicks on a house icon, I'd like to redirect them through to our home page. So if we have this menu on, let's say a search results page and someone wants to return back to the home page, they can just click this icon and we're going to create a new workflow here. And within this workflow, I'm gonna select from the navigation event, I'll choose the go to page action. And I'd like to send someone through to the index page, which is gonna be our home page. That's nice and simple. I'll jump to our next icon here, and I'm going to, once again, start a workflow. Similar to our previous workflow, I'm gonna to head to the navigation events. I'll select the go to page action. And at this point, we haven't yet created a notification page within our app. So what we're gonna do is open up this drop down menu and choose to create that here. So I'm going to call this page the notification page. I'll choose to create this, and we won't need to make any changes to it now. But what I'm gonna do is set the destination page here to be the notification page. If I jump back into my design tab, I'm going to select my bookmark icon. Once again, I'll start a workflow here and I'll select from our navigation events, choose the go to page action. And similar to our notification page, the bookmark page does not yet exist. So I'm gonna to choose to create this here. And I'm going to call this the list page. I will create this. And now I can set the destination page to be my list page here. Then if I jump back into my design tab, I'm going to click on our newspaper icon. And whenever someone clicks on this icon, I'm gonna to want to redirect them through to a dashboard page, which will be used to manage a list of all of their drafted and published stories. So I'm gonna to choose to start a workflow here. And within this workflow, similar to our previous workflows we had built, I'm going to select from our navigation events. I'll choose the go to page action. And at this point, our dashboard page does not yet exist. 
So similar to our previous workflows, we're going to open up our page drop down menu here and we're going to choose to create a new page from scratch. I'll be calling this the dashboard page. I'll choose to create that. Now I can set that as the destination page. And at this point in time, I won't need to send any data through to this page, nor will I need to make any changes to the actual dashboard page itself. And then from here, I'm gonna jump back into my design tab because I'd also like to create a workflow when our little pencil icon is clicked. So when this icon is selected, I'd like to redirect a user through to a page in which they can create a new story. So whether they want to draft or publish a story, this is the page that they'll be doing that on. So what I'm going to do is open up my element inspector here. I'll then choose to start a workflow whenever this icon is clicked. And within this, I'm going to head to the navigation event. Once again, choosing the go to page action. The destination page does not yet exist as we haven't yet created it. So we're going to open up our drop down menu here. We'll scroll all the way down and choose to create yet another new page. And I'll be calling this the create page because this is the page in which someone will be creating a new story on. I'll choose to create this here. I can then select that as my destination page. And once again, I won't need to send any data through to that page. And then finally, the very last thing I'll need to create is a workflow that runs whenever someone selects on our user's profile photo. And in this case, I'm gonna to want to send them through to our settings page and I won't need to send any data through with that. And just like that, that is how we can build our own reusable element for a menu on our page. One thing I'll point out is that because we've built the workflows inside of our reusable element here, if we were to add this menu on any single page within our app, all of those workflows are gonna be functional. So once again, we only had to build them once and then we can easily make them work across any other page. And now if I was to open up my index page, which we're using as our home page here, and if I was to scroll on down my elements menu, just move my head out of the way here, what you'll see is that we now have this reusable element called our left-hand menu that we can choose to add onto my page. And what you'll see is that when I add it on, it looks completely functional, and that's because it is. And that's the beauty of creating reusable elements. You only have to build it once and then you can streamline the whole process of adding it onto a page just by dragging it on as simple as that. One thing I would just like to point out though is that if I was to hover over this element, you'll see that I'm unable to make changes to it here. If you ever need to make changes to your reusable element, you'll need to make changes within the drop down menu here. And any changes you make here are automatically going to apply to wherever you've added this element onto your page. But now from here, beside our menu, what I'd like to do is build out the section of our page, which is going to display almost like a homepage feed. So this is going to be a list of stories that have been published by someone that a user follows, or if they'd like, they could choose to view a list of recommended stories, which are gonna be published by people who this user does not follow. And in order to add this whole section onto my page here, what I'm gonna do is add yet another group within my existing group. And if I was to jump over into my previous example that I had shown you here, what you might notice is that within this group here, so the white group which contains my feed, I have a list of all of the elements stacked vertically, not horizontally. Although within that, as you can see with my two headings here, these are stacked horizontally. So you can see that I'm going to add a series of different groups inside of each other to create the exact experience that we want. And so if I was to jump over into my bubble editor here, I'm not going to create this feed as a reusable element just because I'm going to be using a different version of this feed across separate pages in my app. But what I'd like to do is start by heading up to our containers menu and adding a group element into my existing purple group here. When it comes to this group, I'm gonna remove the style of this and just set the background style to be a flat color. And I'll keep that as white, like the example that I just shown you. I'm then gonna jump over into my layout tab. And the first thing I'd like to do is update the container layout to be a column, because as I mentioned, I'll be stacking elements inside of this from top to bottom, so vertically. I'm then going to unselect that this group should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite which will make this group completely responsive. 
And now the very first thing I'd like to add into my group is going to be the two text options at the top of my page, which when clicked will open up two separate feeds. So as I'd shown you here in my example, I'm going to create one feed which will display a list of stories that have been published by the people that someone is following and another for a list of stories that are recommended to this user. And because these two text elements are gonna be placed side by side, you can see they sit within a group here that has its container layout to be a row. And so what I'm going to do is jump over into my editor and I'm going to add yet another group within my existing white group here. And I'm going to head to my appearance tab. And if I was to keep in line with the example I just shown you, I'm gonna remove the color of this give it a flat color, and I'll just make this a light shade of yellow for the time being. I'm then gonna jump to my layout tab, and I'll update the container layout to be a row, because I'll be stacking elements in this side by side, so horizontally. I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width is zero, leaving the maximum width is infinite, so that way this group becomes completely responsive, regardless of how small or large my page is. And then I'm gonna add my text elements inside this group. So I'm going to head to my visual elements. I'll select to add one text element in, and I'll have this just display the word following. And for this element, I'm just going to remove the style of this and update the font size to be 18, not 16, like it was by default. And that's all I want to change for this particular text element. What I will need to do, of course, is now make this element completely responsive. So I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab here. I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will set the minimum width to zero and also leave the maximum width as infinite. But what I'm also gonna do is tick this option here to fit the width of this element to the content within it. And what you'll now see is that it's going to collapse perfectly around the width of my text. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing for the height. So I'm gonna set the minimum height to be zero which means that it's going to collapse nicely around the height of this text element as well. And now beside this text element, I'd like to add yet another. So I'm going to copy this text element, select my yellow group and paste in another version of this. Only in this instance, I'm gonna have this text display the word recommended. I'm then going to jump into my layout tab. And the only change I'm gonna to need to make is that I'm going to add in 20 pixels of margin on the left-hand side of this text just to make sure it's spaced away from the existing text element inside my yellow group. And now that's everything I want to add inside of this yellow group. So I'm gonna click on the group itself, and then I'll be able to update the responsive settings of its height. So I'm going to set the minimum height here to be zero. And because we have the option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content within it, it's going to wrap around our text quite nicely and there won't be any unnecessary space. What I'm then gonna do is scroll on down to our margins here, and I'm gonna add in 30 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And what this will do is ensure that this group doesn't touch the borders of our existing white group. And it's also going to position this further down on our page. And now below this group, what I'd like to do is add in a repeating group element, which is going to display a list of stories in which a user can choose to click on and then also be redirected through to that dedicated story page. And so what I'm gonna do is scroll on down to our containers menu here and choose to add a repeating group into this page. And if you're not too familiar or comfortable with repeating groups in Bubble, they're just a great way to display a list of items that you have stored within your database. And so in this case, I'm gonna to want to display a list of stories that are relevant to a user. And so the first thing I'm gonna do with this repeating group is head over to my appearance tab here, and I'm going to update the type of content that I'm going to store within this repeating group. In this instance, I'd like to display a list of stories, and I'm going to perform a search in my database to display all of these stories where the person who has created this story is within the current user, so the person who is logged into their homepage and is viewing this particular story, if that person is within their list of people that they're following. And now, as I just mentioned, this is going to display a list of all of the posts that have been published by someone that the current user follows within our application. I'll then choose to close this. And when it comes to the layout of this particular repeating group, 
What I'm going to do is want to display a full list of all of the posts that fit this particular data source. So I'm going to unselect that this repeating group should be a fixed number of rows. I will, however, keep it as a fixed number of columns because I'm only going to want one story to be on each individual line. But one thing I should point out is that because I've unselected that it is a fixed number of rows, what this means is that if there's 20 stories that need to be displayed, they will all be displayed. And then a user can just scroll down our page and view all of those. What I'm then going to do is jump over into my layout tab here, and I'm going to update the container layout for our repeating group. And in this case, I'm actually going to set the container layout to be a row because I'll want to stack elements in this side by side, so horizontally. And I'll be walking you through how I'm going to do that in a moment. But for the time being, the only other thing I want to do is just unselect that this should be a fixed width. Like always, I'm going to set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. I will come back later and update the minimum height. But the only other thing I'm going to do for now is just add in 20 pixels of margin around every single border for this repeating group, just to ensure it doesn't touch any of the other elements on my page. And another personal preference I have is that over in my appearance tab, like before, I'm going to remove the style of this repeating group and add a solid border around this. So that way I can see where it actually sits on my page. And now that I've added my repeating group onto the page, I can start to build out all of the elements that are going to sit within this. And so when it comes to a story, what I'm actually going to want to do is display a list of all of the information for a story on the left hand side of this repeating group. And then on the right hand side, I'd like to display a featured image. And if I show you my previous example that I had created here, as you can see, I have my image on the right hand side. And then on the left hand side, I have this white group here, which houses all of this information. And now because I'm stacking all of these elements on top of each other, I've set the container layout of this white group to be a column. So although it does sit beside my image, any of the content inside of this sits on top of each other. And so what I'm going to do is start by adding that white group into my existing repeating group here. I'm then going to remove the style of this. And just in this example, I'm going to give this a flat color and I might make this just a light shade of green for our example today. And then before I build out all of the content within this particular group, what I'd like to actually do is add in the image element I'd like to display beside this group. So what I'm going to do is scroll on up to my visual elements and I'm going to select to add an image element into my repeating group. And as you'll see, it will now be positioned next to our existing green group. And when it comes to this particular image, what I'd like to do is insert some dynamic data and I'd like to display the featured image of the story within the repeating group cell. So I'm going to reference the current cell story, its featured image. And just a personal preference I have here for thumbnail images is that I'd like to once again process it with Imgix and resize the dimensions of it by cropping it. Like always, when I'm working on images, I'm also just going to add a solid border on it for the time being. Of course, when you preview or publish your application, you can remove that if you'd like, but it just allows me to actually see where this element sits within my repeating group. I'm then going to jump to my layout tab here and I'm going to update the width of this repeating group to be 150 pixels. And I'm going to keep this a fixed width because I won't want this to expand or contract based on the size of the page. I'm always going to want this to be 150 pixels. I'm also going to select that this should have a fixed aspect ratio of one to one. So that's going to make it a perfect square. And then finally, I'm going to vertically align this image in the center of my overall repeating group. And then finally, I'm just going to add in 10 pixels of margin on the left hand side of this image, which is just going to ensure that it doesn't touch my green group here. And now once I've added that image in, what I'd like to do is actually update the responsive settings for this green group. So I can now expand it to take up all of the remaining space within our repeating group. And so what I'm going to do first is update the container layout to be a column, because as I'd shown you in my example, I'm going to be stacking elements in this from top to bottom. So vertically. I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. And if I set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite, what you'll now see is that it's going to take up all of the remaining space within our repeating group here. And now later on, I will come back and update the height settings of this group. But for now, I'm going to need to add in all of my elements inside of this first. 
And the very first element I'd like to add is just going to be a series of images and text elements that's just going to display the photo and name of the person who has published this particular story. So if I was to jump over to my existing example I'd shown you, as you can see at the top of each story, it has the profile photo of someone who published it, their name, and then the date in which it was published. And because all of these elements are positioned side by side, I'm gonna to need to add yet another group into my existing group here. And I'll be needing to set that new group's container layout to be a row, so I can place elements side by side. So I'm going to scroll on down to my containers. I'm going to add yet another group into my existing group here. I'm going to update its appearance first. I'll remove the style of this and give it a flat color. I'm happy to just keep this as white for now. I'll then jump over into my layout tab and update its container layout to be a row, because as I just mentioned, I'm gonna be stacking elements in this from side to side. I'll then unselect that this element should be fixed with because I want to make this fully responsive. So I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And now before I update any of the height settings, I will add in all of those different elements I'm going to place inside of this. And so the first element is going to be the profile photo of the person who has published this particular story. And so in order to do that, I'm gonna to need to add in an image element into this group here. And from here, what I'm gonna do is choose to insert dynamic data. And in order to reference the data of the story within our repeating group, what I'm gonna to need to do before that is send some data through to our white group here. So because our white group sits within actually another group, which sits within our repeating group, I'm gonna to need to pass the data from our repeating group through to each one of those groups in order to reference it within our image here. Because as you can see, we don't have the option to reference the current cells data. And so what I'm gonna to need to do is pass that through to our image here. And so in order to do that, I'm going to first select on our white group here. And in order to view the green group that it sits within, I'm going to right click on this white group and I'll choose to select its first parent. And now what you'll see is that I've currently selected the green group which sits directly within our repeating group. And this is where working with group elements can start to get a little bit confusing, which is why I personally still like to color code all of my groups. And so because our green group is the first group that sits within my repeating group, I'm going to give it a type of content, which is a story. And then I'm going to have it fetch the data from the repeating group cell that it sits within. And now what I can do is click on my white group, which sits within my green group. And I can also select that I want it to have the value of a story. And I want it to fetch the data of its parent group. And so because my white group sits within my green group, my green group is referred to as the parent. And so because it's fetching data from my repeating group, it's passing that on to my green group, which is passing it on to my white group. And I know at this point, you're probably sick of me saying the word group, but this is just the best way to do it within Bubble. I'm then going to select on my image, which sits within my white group. And I can now choose to display the parent group's story, the creator of that story, their profile photo. And so as you can see, I can now reference the data from my original repeating group cell. I'm then gonna to choose to process this image with Imgix, just so I can select to resize the dimensions by cropping it. I'll then scroll on down to the styling of this image and I'll add a solid border around this. I'll also set the roundness to be 100, so it becomes a perfect circle. And then I'll need to update the size of this image. So I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab here. And for the dimensions of this image, I'm gonna make it 40 pixels. I will keep it a fixed width because I won't want it to expand or contract based on the size of my page. I'm also going to select to keep this element's aspect ratio fixed. And I'll keep that ratio as 1 to 1, so that way it is a perfect square. And then finally, I'm just going to vertically align this in the center of my white group, so that way it's at the center at all given times. Beside this, I'm going to add in a text element that will display the name of the person who has published this story. So I'm going to insert dynamic data and I'll display the parent group story, the creator of that story, their name. And then from here, I'm just going to jump over into my layout tab and update its responsive settings. So I'm going to start by vertically aligning this in the center of my group. So that way it's perfectly in line with my image there. I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. 
but I'm also going to select to fit the width of this element to the content inside of it. So that way, regardless of how long a user's name is, this element will be completely responsive on that and it will collapse around it. I'm then going to do the same thing for our minimum height here. I'll set that to be zero. And then finally, I'm just going to add in 10 pixels of margin on the left hand side. So that way it doesn't touch the actual image that sits beside it. And then from here, I'm going to make a copy of this text element. I'll select my white group. I'll paste this in. And while I'm happy with the layout settings of this text element, I'm going to jump over to my appearance tab and I'm just going to remove some of this dynamic data. In this case, what I'd like to do is display the parent group story, its creation date. And I'd just like to format this as a particular date style. And I personally just like to choose the abbreviated written version of the date here. I'm then going to close this. And that's all of the elements I need to add within my white group here. So what I'm going to do is select on the white group itself. I'm going to jump to the layout tab and I can now update the minimum height here to be zero. And because I have this option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content within it, it's going to collapse nicely around all of those text elements there. Then below this group, what I'd like to do is add in yet another text element that's going to stack vertically. And in this case, I just like to display the title of this particular story. So I'm going to insert dynamic data and display the parent group story, the title of it. And in this case, I'm going to remove the style here and I'll be updating the font size here to be 20. And I'd also like to bold this font format. I can then jump into my layout tab here. And of course, I'll need to make this element completely responsive. So I'm going to, like always, unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. I won't need to select to fit the width of this element to the content within it. Although I will need to set the minimum height to be zero because I have that option selected for the height here. And finally, I'm just going to add in 10 pixels of margin at the top, just so this text element isn't touching our existing group that sits above it there. Then below this text element, I'm going to add in yet another text element. And this is just going to display the preview text for this post. So this is just the first 100 characters, just to hook a user into reading the first little section of that story. In which, of course, if they wanted to view the full contents of this, they could just click through on the story and view the full post. And so in this case, I'm going to insert dynamic data and I'm going to display the parent group story, the preview text here. I'm quite happy with the style and the size of this font. The only thing I will just want to change in our layout tab is, of course, the responsive settings. So like always, I'm going to unselect that that should be a fixed width. I'll set a minimum width as zero, leaving a maximum width as infinite. I'll do the same for our height. And then I'll also just add in another 10 pixels of margin at the top of this. And we're almost there at this point. The very last elements I'd like to add into this repeating group is just going to be two elements that sit side by side. If I show you my previous example here, what I have is a multi-line input field, which is just going to display a list of all of the topics that are related to this story. And then beside that, I have a little bookmark icon, which when clicked, we're going to build out a workflow that allows someone to save a feature to their list of saved stories. And so because these two elements sit side by side, of course, I'm going to need to add yet another group into my existing white group, and I'm going to set its container layout to be a row. So I'm going to jump into my new editor here. I will scroll on down to our containers and add yet another group inside of this here. Only this time I'm going to jump to my appearance tab, remove the style of this group, and I'm going to set a flat background color on this group. I might make this just a light shade of red for the time being, make it a little bit lighter than that. Then I'll jump over into my layout tab. I'll set the container layout to be a row because I'll be placing two elements side by side, so horizontally. I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. To make this responsive, like always, I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And now from here, I can add my two elements into this group. So I'm going to start by adding in a multi-line input field to display a list of all of the topics that someone has selected are relevant to this particular story. So I'm going to select my multi dropdown field here. I'm going to add this in. And in this case, the first thing I'm going to do is jump over into my appearance tab here. 
because what I'd like to do is update the type of content that's going to be displayed within this field. And so because I'd like to display a list of all of the topics that have been saved for this particular story, I'm gonna set the choices style here to be a list of dynamic choices. The type of choices I'll be displaying is of course our topics, which is our option set list. I'll allow us to display all of the topics. And for the text that's displayed, I'll just have this be the display text of each option set choice. But the main thing I'm interested in here is updating the default value. So this is like the initial content for this particular field. So if I add a default value in here, it's going to display all of the topics that a user has selected are relevant to this particular story. So for the default value, I'd like this to be the parent groups thing. And now at this point, I haven't yet sent through the data to my new red group. So because this red group sits within my existing green group, I'm once again gonna need to update its type of content to be a story. And I'll need it to extract the data from the green group that it sits within, which means in my element here, I can now reference the parent group story. So the data stored within the red group. I'd like to pull a list of all of the topics that have been saved for this story. And when it comes to this multi-line input field, because it is an input field, I'm going to want to select this option here to disable its input field functionality. And the reason I'm doing that is because I don't want people to be able to search and add any additional topics. In this case, I only wanted to display a list of existing topics. And then from here, I'm just gonna quickly scroll on down and the only change I'm gonna to make to the design of this element is that I'm going to update the background style here to be none, so that way it doesn't have a flat color. If you really wanted, you could also remove the solid border around it, but I'm just gonna leave that there for the time being so I can actually see where this element sits within my overall group. But from here, I'm going to select on the multi-line input field again. I'll jump over into my layout tab. And what I'd like to do is unselect that this element should be fixed width. I'm then going to set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite, which will just ensure that it takes up as much space as it possibly can. I will leave the minimum height as 45, just because I'm quite happy with the height of this input field here. And then from here, I'm just going to add in one last element into this red group, and that is going to be an icon element, which is going to be a little bookmark icon, which of course, when clicked later on, we're gonna build out a workflow that allows us to save a particular story into a user's list of bookmark stories. And so of course, I'm gonna scroll on up to my visual elements to add in an icon. And as you'll see, this will be placed beside our existing multi-line input field because the container layout of its parent is set to be a row. I'm then gonna search for my bookmark icon. I'll select the empty bookmark icon here. I'll then jump into my layout tab and move this to the next position within my group. I'm gonna to want to vertically align this in the center of my group. And then I'll update the height here to be 30 pixels in width by 30 pixels in height. And I'll be keeping these as fixed options because of course I won't want this icon to expand out or down based on the size of my page. I'm always gonna want it to be 30 by 30. And finally, I'm going to jump back to my multi-line input field. I'd like to ensure that this is centered in the middle of my group at all times as well. So that way these items are perfectly placed beside each other. Then I'm going to click on my overall red group. I'll jump over into my layout tab and set the minimum height to be zero. And because I have the option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content within it, it will collapse nicely around that. I am just gonna to want to add in 10 pixels of margin at the top. And then I'd also like to add in 10 pixels of margin at the bottom. And now because that is all of the elements I'd like to add inside of my group here, I'm going to select on my green group. I'm then going to update its minimum height to be zero. And what you'll now see is that it collapses quite nicely around all of the elements inside of it. One little change I might just make is that I can see that my repeating group cells are quite compacted together. So I'm just gonna click on my white group at the top here and give it 10 pixels of margin at the top, which will just give it some additional space between each entry row here. I'm also then just going to click on my overall repeating group. And if I jump into our layout tab here, I'm gonna update the minimum height to be zero. And because I also have the option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content within it, 
it's going to collapse nicely around everything in total. And of course, although you can see only one cell here, rest assured that if you need to load 10, 20, or 100 stories, they will all be displayed down on your page. And now from here, there's one last feature I'd like to add onto this page, and that is going to be the ability to switch between two different feeds. So I'd like to allow someone to either filter the list of stories that are displayed by the people that they are either following or by a list of recommended posts which have been published by people who they don't follow. And so similar to our previous dashboard page where a user can manage their stories, we're gonna leverage some custom states to create a menu option between these two text elements. So if you remember, if I was to open up my dashboard page, at the top of my page here, I had two text elements. One that when clicked allowed us to view all of the stories that have been created as drafts. And then the other, which when clicked, would allow us to display all of the published posts by a user. I'm gonna to want to create much the same experience over on our index page here. And so what we're gonna do is start by creating some custom states on our page. And then we're gonna create a way to update that custom state based on whichever text element is clicked. And so what I'm gonna do is select on my overall page, which if you remember is our gray element down here, referred to as the index page. I'm then going to open up my information icon and similar to before, I'm gonna create yet another custom state. I'll have this one be called display following. I'll choose to set this as a yes, no state type. I'll create this. I'll then add an additional state and this will be called display recommended. And this will also be a yes, no state type. And in this case, I'm gonna to want to set the default value of our display following state to be yes. And the default value of our display recommended state to be no, because as soon as this page is loaded, I'd like to actually display the following feed, not the recommended feed. Of course, I'm only gonna to want to display the recommended feed whenever someone selects on this recommended option. And so what I'm gonna do is choose to close my element inspector here, and I'm gonna to need to create a way to update my custom states whenever one of these text elements is clicked. So similar to our dashboard page, I'm going to start by creating a workflow whenever the following text is clicked here. And in this case, what I'm gonna to want to do is type in the word state, I'll choose to set the state of an element. The element I'll be setting the state of is our overall index page. And the custom state I'll be changing is the display a following state. I'll want to ensure that this is set to yes. I'm also gonna to want to ensure that the display recommended state is then switched off to no. So that way I'm only displaying the relevant feed at the relevant time. Like always, when I'm working with a custom state, as I'd mentioned in the past, I like to update these with a event color. I'm gonna select that this should be blue once again. I'm then gonna jump back into my design tab here and I'm gonna to want to create yet another workflow that's triggered whenever this text is clicked. So I'm gonna start a workflow. I'm going to add an action and type in the word state. I'll be setting the state of an element here. The element will be our index page. The custom state will now be our display recommended state. And in this case, I'd like to set that as yes. And because I'm setting this state as yes, I'll need to ensure that my display following state is now set to no. It's as simple as that. I'll then jump to my event trigger and I'll update this to be blue. So that way I know that this is also a custom state workflow. I'll then jump over into my design tab and I'm just gonna create a quick condition on each of these text elements that just bolds the formatting of this text based on the current option that a user has selected just so we can notify them of which feed they're currently looking at. So I'm gonna to head to my conditional tab here for our recommended text. And I'm gonna create a condition that just recognizes when the index page, when it's display recommended custom state is set to yes. I'm going to update the font weight to be a 600. And of course, if I'd like, I could toggle this on and off to see what that's gonna look like. Then I'm gonna do the exact same thing for my following text here. I'm gonna click on this. I'll choose to define a new condition and I'm going to recognize when our index page, when the display following custom state is set to yes. I would like to update the font weight here to also equal 600. 
And that's how we can now update the custom state stored on our page. But of course, we're gonna to need to create a way to reflect that with the data source of our repeating group. So if I click on the repeating group here, you might remember at this point, it's searching for a list of stories that were created by someone who the current user follows. One other thing I should point out is that I'd like to add an additional constraint on this that only allows us to display stories where the published status is yes, because if we don't add this on, it's going to display every single story in our database, which includes stories that are currently saved as drafts. And we of course don't want those to be displayed on our homepage as they've not yet been published. So I'm gonna add an additional state here and I'm going to make sure I only display posts where the is published status equals yes. And then I'm going to jump over into the condition tab of my repeating group here. And similar to our text elements here on the top of our page, I'm going to define a condition that's just gonna recognize when the display recommended state is set to yes, in which case I'm gonna give our repeating group a different data source. So I'm gonna define a condition that's just going to recognize when the index page, when its display recommended state is currently set to yes. What I'm gonna do is choose to update the data source of this repeating group and I'm going to perform a search in my database for a list of stories where first of all, the is published status equals yes. And then where the created by field, so the person who has published this story, I wanna make sure that this person is not being followed by the current user because this is a recommended story. It's something that the user probably isn't familiar with. So I'm gonna set that the created by field shouldn't be within. So I'll select the isn't in option, the current users list of people that they're following. And then if I really wanted, I could also choose to sort these as a random order. So I'm gonna select the random sorting option, which just means it's going to rotate through a random list of stories that are gonna be relevant to a user. And now look, if I really wanted to get technical, what I could actually do is recommend stories based on a user's interest that they've saved within their own settings page. So as you might remember, within our settings page, a user had selected a list of topics that they identified that they were interested in. So these were things like marketing, startups, or machine learning. And what we can actually do is add what's called a filter onto this search here to only display the stories that have a topic published on them that matches a topic that our current user is interested in. So it's just going to recommend a whole lot more relevant list of stories. And so if I was to close this data search here and select the more option, I can type in the word filter. And what you'll see is that I can add an additional filter onto this search. And a filter is almost like a search within a search, but it just gives you the ability to add in some advanced features. And in this case, I'm going to add what's called another constraint onto this. And if I just type in the word advanced, it's going to open up access to that list of features. And in this case, for the advanced filter here, I'm going to only want to display a list of stories from our initial search where the story itself, when it's list of topics, and then if I type in the word intersects with, what I can do is select the intersects with option. And what this essentially means is that the topics within this story should intersect with a user's current topics that they're interested in. So that just means that the topic of the story should have a matching value between a topic that a user is interested in. So the best way to explain what intersecting is, is just by showing you this illustration with my fingers, where these are all of the topics that a user has published on their story. And these are a list of all of the other topics that a user has mentioned they're interested in. If we have a match between those topics, these are going to overlap with each other. And that's just what's referred to as intersect with. It kind of just means that it overlaps with something from another list. And the list that I want it to overlap with is the current user, their list of topics that they are interested in. So I'm going to select the interested topics. And in this case, I want to display a story that has at least one topic that matches a user's interests. So I'm going to say that the count of all of the matches will need to be greater than zero. 
So that just means, as I just said, there's going to be at least one match between the topic that's been added to this published story and the topics that the user has listed that they're interested in. And now this definitely is more of an advanced feature within Bubble. So if you just found everything I said to be incredibly confusing, please don't fret. I just wanted to show you this though, so that way you could get an idea of what's actually possible inside of Bubble. But if this didn't make a whole lot of sense, what I'd recommend doing is just re-watching that section in order to understand this at your own pace. But thankfully at this point, that is everything I want to cover within this particular module. This was a huge section of our tutorial today. And between using a reusable element, a custom state, as well as our additional filter here, there was a lot of complex things that I wanted to cover. So I'm not gonna cover anything else at this point in time. What I would just love to do though, is just show you a quick a little look of how this homepage is going to function within a preview of our application. Over in a preview of my homepage here, I'm just gonna reduce this size of my browser so we can see my navigation menu. And what you'll find is that I'm able to click on any of these icons here and it will redirect me through to the relevant page. What you'll also see is that I currently don't have any stories being displayed within my following tab. And the reason for that is because we haven't built out the feature to follow or unfollow a user yet. However, if I was to jump over into my recommended tab here, I've jumped ahead and I've also created a, a different account, which I currently don't yet follow. And I've published a story within their account. And so because that story had a relevant tag to my own interests, and because I'm not following this user, it has displayed that within my recommended feed. One thing I have noticed though, is that at this point in time, my own post is being displayed within the recommended feed as well. And while that's not the end of the world, if you wanted to create a way to actually remove someone's own post from the recommended feed, I'd be happy to show you how. If we were to jump back into our bubble editor here, I'm just going to move my head out of the way. What we could do is select on our repeating group itself and open up our condition that displays our recommended data source. So whenever someone clicks on the recommended tab here, we're going to display a list of posts that have been published by someone that the current user does not yet follow. And if we were to open up the filter, what we can do is filter out a list of posts that were created by the current user. And the way I can do that is by adding yet another constraint within my filter here. And I'm going to once again type in the advanced filter to open up a new list of functionalities. And essentially what I'm gonna do is just reference the ID of the person who created a particular story. And if that matches the same ID as the current user who is logged in, I am not gonna want to display this particular story. And so what I'm gonna do is select that this story that I'm filtering, if the creator of that story, I'm gonna type in the word unique ID, I'm gonna to want to make sure it is not the same ID as the current user, their unique ID. And now that's going to filter out any stories that were published by the current user. So if I was to jump back into my preview here and refresh this page, what you'll now see is within my recommended feed, I don't have the post created by my own Lachlan Kirkwood account. So that story is now hidden. And the only other thing I'd just like to point out on this page is that with my preview text, I forgot to add the three little dots that just prompts a user to click through to view the full post. So if I jump over into my editor, click on my preview text here, I'm just going to add in my three little dots. I'll refresh my page once again. I will then open up my recommended feed as well. And now you can see that this is just a small little snippet of the overall post that we've published. And of course, one thing I'd just like to point out is that this page is completely responsive right now. Although I, I will be coming back later on to show you how we can build out the responsive setting where we move this left-hand menu to the bottom of the screen. But for the time being, this was a monster module to cover. So what we're gonna do is jump back into our Notion doc here, and we're going to check off that we're finished building out the homepage, as well as a whole suite of features that I wanted to include within this, like being able to create the two separate feeds of medium stories. 
So the one created by people that the current user is following, as well as the recommended feed. And now one thing I'd just like to point out is that at this point in our tutorial, we haven't quite yet finished the home page. We'll still need to build out our custom search experience, which will allow users to search for stories by a query, as well as a selected topic or category that they'd like to filter by. But for the time being, I'm just going to check everything off in my Notion checklist here, just so I can keep a track of where I'm up to within our build. At this point in our tutorial, that is all I have time for in this video. As you can see, we've been building for hours and we've still barely scratched the surface on what's possible using Bubble. If you were interested in completing the full build for your own Medium clone, I'd recommend hitting the link in the description to purchase access to the full course. Within this, we still have so many features that I need to teach you, including building a search results page, a way for users to bookmark and save stories for later, as well as how we can, of course, display the full details of an individual story on a dynamic page. And from there, I also explain how you can create engagement features. So things like being able to clap or comment on a story, which of course will then send a notification to the person who is receiving that. And then from there, we're also going to create a user profiles as well as build a paywall to limit what content we can actually display to free users. I genuinely think that if you're trying to build your own medium clone, the course is going to save you months of time having to learn all of this from scratch yourself. In the meantime, though, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for taking the time to watch this video on YouTube. Of course, if you wanted to stay up to date with all of my bubble content, I'd recommend hitting the subscribe button so that way you'll be the first to know when I drop a new video. But for the time being, I wish you all the best on your own no-code journey.